I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. This was really a complete discovery for me, this meeting. I, uh, in fact, I, as I was walking around the halls, I've been working all my life in magnetism, and as I was walking around the halls, I was thinking to myself, everything or much of the thing that is done here was already done by Faraday, as far as a scientist is concerned. But then I said, well, I can't say this here because, you know, this is a meeting. And then the speaker just before me that was talking about transforming himself said this and showed these movies from the 50 years ago. So I was actually quite uh, happy to see that uh, I was not that off the mark. Now, while it is true that everything, more or less, the basis of here is, uh, was done by Faraday, there is other things that are not done by Faraday, which is basically all the computer control that you have on things and all the all the software kind of things that you have here. So it's not quite like that, because if you try to wind the coils like he was showing in the movies, you would probably lose a lot of money today if you would do that. What I will tell you is about, about, uh, about uh, disruptive technology, which is a consequence of science. And so the way I planned this talk, and I'm not sure that I planned it properly, but I think I did, I, I wanted to show you one miracle after another that happened as a consequence of science. And I decided to put up uh, the following. So in, if you look in the past, and if uh, 50 years ago I would have told people we will be able to look inside your, uh, inside your body, oh, I, this is, doesn't work, if, uh, that we will be able to look inside your body, or we will talk, talk to the moon, or we will see you think, you would have said this man is totally out of his mind. Now, I remember myself when this was uh, kind of a, a science fiction kind of a thing. Uh, in the present, you know that you can contact anybody in the world and everybody is constantly, uh, I, I, I see people here actually sitting and doing my talk, talking to somebody else in the, through, your, uh, through the uh, you know, uh, internet. And uh, I will show you something that is important for this field, which is basically how to separate the spin from the charge of the electron which is something kind of totally uh, mind-boggling because if you think about it, if you have a ball that is spinning, what I will show you, an actual device in which the ball is going that way, but the spinning is going that way, which is, sounds like totally crazy, but it's some kind of a miracle. And then I will tell you about the future. I will tell you about some intelligent materials that maybe will be able to solve some of the problems that were presented before and maybe relevant to transformers, where instead of the intelligence being in the in the software of the material, the intelligence will be in the material itself. And then the next thing that I will tell you is having two children and having educated many, many children, I will show you how you can learn something from, from your children, which is basically a miracle on its own. Okay. So, um, so let me show you about evolutionary research. What is evolutionary research? And that is not what I will tell you about. Here it is evolutionary research. So the scientists from the RAND Corporation have created this model to illustrate how a home computer could look like in the year 2004. This was 50 years ago. Okay? However, the needed technology will be not be economically feasible for the average home. Also, the scientists readily admit that the computer will require not yet invented technology to actually work. You can tell that that man there is uh, 50 years ago. Um, but 50 years from now, scientific progress is expected to solve the problems. This is what it was told to us 50 years ago, or 60 years ago now. And then it says, with teletype interface, which is this thing, I don't think anybody in the audience except for me remembers this thing, and with the Fortran language, which is something that was invented by the Egyptian or somebody, okay, this a home computer will expect to, uh, uh, to, to be, be easy to use. Now think about it, if, if this is how your laptop would be uh, nowadays, then that man would be sitting on your lap, and he, uh, he would be computing for you, and I would be working on the third wheel on this thing, or whatever the hell this wheel is for. That's not what I will tell you. I, I will tell you about evolutionary research versus transformative research. So that's my, the purpose of my talk here. Now, if you only care about immediate solution, it's about how to solve a particular transform and how to solve that, that. This is not the talk for you. This is not what I'm going to talk about. I will talk about disruptive technologies, and you will see that the more disruptive the technology that I will tell you about it is, the more speculative it is. So here it is. This is actually from my thesis work. It is really great. This is a, a Woodstock. He's saying, uh, and actually it's very appropriate for today, 
because it, it, it helps things to grow. It fills up the lakes and oceans so the fish ones can swim around and gives us all something to drink. And then it says, Woodstock doesn't care what it is as long as he can understand it. Now, this is what I'm telling you. I'm telling you about science. I'm telling you about basic research, which is curiosity driven, is not driven by some specific application. That's what I will tell you about. That's what we scientists do. OK, so let's just talk a, a few, three or four minutes about the past. So in the past, you can ask the you, people were asking the question, where does the radiation from an electrode comes? And then the, the, uh, uh, some years ago, there was this man that, that noticed that a barium platinocyanide screen fluorescing in his laboratory as he generated cathode rays in a Crookes tube some distance away. Now, this for people that are not technical means absolutely nothing. But he published that paper. And that paper that you can see there, and in purpose, I just, it, it took me a while to find this out. That paper is a paper that, um, I don't know why this thing doesn't quite work well there. Oh, and this paper is this paper. It said, Über eine neue Art von Strahlen, which means on a new kind of rays. OK? Now, this man knew what he was doing. He published this paper, and then he got the very first Nobel Prize in physics. His name was Röntgen, and he did a very miraculous thing. We can look inside your body, but he did something which is even more miraculous than that. He convinced his wife to put her hand under his machine there. You can see that it's his wife's hand. You can see that's his wedding band. I have not been able to convince my wife to do anything, actually. All right, so that's the first miracle. And here it is now. I was just in London last week, and you see this was it's even used for art. So this is some, uh, from the London Times, some kind of an art uh, thing there that they use the X-ray for this. OK, so then you can look at the electrons close to a surface. So if you look at the electrons close to a surface, there were these papers that you would sit, sit here and say, well, this is totally useless for me. Why is this guy talking about this? The surface states in silicon. There were two men that were very influential on this. One of, the, one of them, his name was Shockley. The other man, uh, man's name was John Bardeen. And they talk about surface states and rectification at a metal semiconductor uh, uh, contact. Now, you would say, OK, this is totally irrelevant. They produce this very ugly looking uh, uh, device that very ugly. Then they got the Nobel Prize. So those are the three people that got the Nobel Prize in 1956. And this is what gave rise to the transistor, the biggest invention of the 20th century, the transistor. Then you can ask another question. Why different elements absorb radio frequency differently? I'm just walking down the hall here. There is a company that actually sells these kind of machines down here. And um, uh, these are, this was the paper that was written. Again, you would say this paper is completely irrelevant. Why should I pay any attention to it? Magnetic resonance from non-rotating fields. This was by the name of Bloch and uh, Siegert, and there were uh, several others. They got the Nobel. Uh, there is four Nobel Prizes in physics uh, for, this, for nuclear magnetic resonance. And we can actually see you think. You put your head inside this machine, we can look at your brain, and when you're thinking, different parts of the, the brain light up. What does this mean? It's hard to tell, but uh, you know, uh, it, can be, it can be done. And I'm sure that eventually it will be done. This is all from asking basic research questions in physics. Now, so basic research pays. It led to you know, all these different applications. The problem is the following. Is here it is another miraculous discovery, a fantastic discovery. These are called superconductors. Now, superconductors are these materials that actually have been touted to be used in, in actually in this field, as for instance, current fault limiters. And uh, the superconductor is something that uh, I've been trying to explain it to my friends. And I have not been able to explain it to my friends until a friend of mine in South America and Chile, a poet, I was talking to her and I was explaining to her what I do. And then she said, oh, I finally wrote a poem for you. I understand what you do. And here it is what she wrote. So this is a poem uh, from a Chilean scientist. Uh, and uh, uh, it says, metales como los hombres cuando llegan a temperatura crítica pierden toda resistencia. Now, for people that don't speak Spanish, I translated it for you. It says, metals like men, when they reach a critical temperature, they lose all resistance. OK? So that's what superconductors are all about. There are these materials that actually have zero resistance. And they work more or less like this. In an electrical conductor, what you have these electrons are floating around inside the electrical conductor. And, uh, and because, the because the electrons scatter from the lattice vibrations, there are the lattice vibrations, 
because they scatter from those lattice vibrations, then you get electrical resistance. Now, it turns out that uh, electrons not only can go individually through this, they can go what is called in a macroscopic coherence. This is where things become very technical, and I won't tell you about it, but they can go as macroscopic coherence, and this leads to zero resistance. So now if you sit here and you ask yourself, will this be useful? Clearly it's useful. It is so useful that in the US, for instance, comedians uh, have uh, talked about no! the superconductors. <laughs> No, awards are the only true measure of human worth. <laughs> if he hadn't won the 2003 Nobel Prize for Physics, would Tiger Beat have made a poster of Alexei Alexeyevich Abrikosov? <laughs> oh, Alexei. Oh, superconductors and superfluids. You see, comedians can talk about this, uh, this stuff. Look so it up. It's really very important, Still, clearly. Okay, it is so important that even children can do it. So even children can do it. So this is my, uh, my uh, well now my 37 year old son, but he used to be 10 years old. Superconductivity is just a child play. That if you look there in the corner, it says Daniel Schuler. That's my 10 year old son in the, in the uh, Chicago Tribune. Okay, doing superconductivity. So clearly comedians can do it. Children can do it. This is clearly, they got a lot of Nobel prizes in physics. There is, I don't know how many, but there is lots of Nobel prizes in physics for this for this uh, subject. So this is clearly extremely important, okay? It clearly should lead to lots of applications. And uh, here it is, the applications that uh, it, it should lead to. So this in 1987 was this big discovery in this field, and they showed motors and all kinds of superconductivity applications. They even, uh, they even lifted a, a sumo wrestler there. Uh, I don't understand why this thing is very slow somehow. Okay, anyway, so. So there is your sumo wrestler uh, floating on a, on a superconductor. This is actually a, a sumo wrestler floating on the superconductor. This is the Time magazine that said wiring for the future. If you look around this conference here, where this thing should be useful, it's nowhere. I have not seen one single company that sells anything superconducting at this conference, and I can assure you that the application of superconductivity is very low. So clearly, this should be important. Clearly, it's obvious to everybody it should be important, and there's a very important lesson from, to, 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 uh, to learn from this. It, that it's hard to predict which things are important, why it is not important, and why it is not being used at this conference. We can have a long discussion about it, but it is hard to predict. That's the main lesson. So what, what I, so, the hardest thing, this, this is credited actually to Yogi Berra, which was a baseball uh, uh, player in the US, but uh, that the hardest thing to predict is the future. And that's what they asked me to do here, okay? So uh, the basic research pays, I showed you that already, but it is impossible to predict where it pays. That's the main problem here that, I'm, that we are facing. So let me tell you about the present. You can ask yourself the following question is, what happens to the magnetoresistance? That is to say, the magnetic field dependence of the resistance of materials. And many of us, about uh, 30 years ago, started working on these classes of materials, which are these layered materials. There are these orange and blue materials, which, as you can see, I colored each one of them by hand, because this was before software existed to do this, and each one of those were colored by me by hand. And, uh, and uh, this was the first conference in this subject. We are working on this, and in 1988, there was this paper which is unassumingly very, very technical. It says giant magnetoresistance of 001 iron chromium magnetic superlattices. This actually has led to something that each one of you uses today millions of times, an hour, millions of times. It led to, to, to what is called the phenomenon of giant magnetoresistance. You use it millions of, of times every day, in this device, which is what is called a read head in your computer. Millions of times you use it in, in your read head, and these two men actually got the Nobel Prize for the 2007 Nobel Prize for it, Grunberg and Firth. I'm actually spending a sabbatical in Firth's lab just now uh, at this very moment. In fact, uh, very interestingly, actually, uh, uh, I, I can't resist to say this, uh, my work was highlighted in, actually in there. So if you look there, it says that uh, that there were reports of observation of substantial magnetoresistance effects before the Nobel Prize. And actually, there it is, Ivan Schuller, reference number nine. I know this from memory, believe me. OK, so what is the cool science that you can do? Well, the cool type of science that you can do 
is uh, this kind of it's science where you make things smaller and you make things at shorter times. And that's cool science. How this will lead to application is very hard to predict. And I'm telling you the giant magnetoresistance resistance is one of these examples. In 20 years, it take, took over the world. There is nothing that you can do to, with computers today if it wouldn't be for giant magnetoresistance. resistance. And 20 years ago, it was just one of those curiosities of science. OK, so, um, so, so now I will show you some cool science. So I will show you something called the Cheshire Cat. This is from Alice in Wonderland. And this Cheshire cat was a cat that was going around and was smiling all the time. And when he left, he left his smile behind. OK, and that's what I will show you that we can actually scientifically realize this. Now, to be more technical, um, what I will show you is a device in which I can separate an electron, which is spinning, from its spin. So here is the device. The device consists of a material which is an orange material. It's called a normal material. It's not magnetic. And there is two magnetic materials on top of it. And I circulate a current in this circuit here. And what I will do is I will measure the voltage in this other circuit here. Now, there is no electric current flowing there. There is no electric current flowing in that circuit there, and therefore, all my students in the first class in engineering that I teach every year, they would tell me, you're absolutely out of your mind to measure a voltage here. Why the hell would you measure a voltage there? There should be no voltage there. There is no current there. Well, actually, this device, obviously, I wouldn't show it to you. It's actually this Cheshire Cat. There it is, the non-local voltage is called. Now, I can't get in the technical details of this, but there is a voltage there. And there it is, the voltage. It depends on the magnetic orientation of those two electrodes. And there is a voltage which can be measured, which actually is used in, uh, it's used in, um, it's used in devices nowadays. And it is a purely spin current. There is no charge current there. So the electrons move to one side, but the spins can move to both sides. And I can see the smile of this Cheshire cat that is left behind. I can actually realize it in the lab. Now, um, there's all kinds of interesting things that have to do with memory and all kinds of interesting things. OK, so now, so why, where are we now? We have an electron that has a spin and a charge. And it used to be that the charge gave rise to electronics, and the spin in the electronics thing gives rise, for instance, to well, everything that you see here, or it gave rise to, to, to read heads or things like this. Today, these two things are mixed together, actually. And that's what the, the new thing is called spin electronics or spintronics. And I'm not sure how this will impact uh, transformers. I mean, you know, this is mostly a transformer conference. But it can, maybe it does uh, impact it in some way or some form. OK, so here it is, the, the, the impact that there is already investigated is these devices. So there is the technology. There it is, the, the, the technical, uh, the, the, the scientific invention of it. It is uh, used in this drive. There it's investigated nowadays for sensors. These are called spin torque sensors, which are sensors that rely on the fact that when an electron goes by, the magnetization actually is affected by it, by the electrons going by. So that's called a spin torque uh, effect. It's, it's some kind of a basic research effect. There is also uh, something called an exchange bias effect, where the hysteresis loop of a ferromagnet is not centered at zero field. It's displaced from zero field because this ferromagnet is in proximity or next to something that is not ferromagnetic, something that is called antiferromagnetic. OK, so where is the future going now? So this, was, this is the present. We are working on this right now. And this thing is going to lead to devices and to things, no question about it. It's leading to all kinds of industries and things. OK, so now, see, the, actually, Yogi Berra didn't say this. It was Niels Bohr that said this. Niels Bohr was a Danish scientist uh, who said that uh, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Now, that's what I'm supposed to do here. So now, how the hell am I going to do this? I don't know. So where would we go next? So I will try to make some realistic extrapolation from what we know now, scientifically. OK, so here it is. A, a, a few years ago, what was a, a computer that had 11,968 processors, 12 terabytes of memory, 600 terabytes of uh, disk storage. This was cost about $200 million to make. Now, I did something much better than this. I did it for $30,000, something that can do much better than this computer. And I, I venture to say that pretty much most of you could do this also. This is this. His name is Jonathan Schuller. He's now 30 years old. He can do much more than that computer can do. 
And so the question is, can he teach me something that that computer cannot? And that's what I'm going to tell you about. So what can he teach me? So when he was six months old, I used to watch him sitting in his stroller and playing with his mobile. And I was wondering, is there something about intelligence that I can learn out of this? So this is what is called biological inspired science. So that was Jonathan looking at his mobile. And then I started reducing him. My wife really likes this because I reduced my son to this. It had a central processor. He has some sensors on the side. Those sensors have some local processing. I mean, if he touches fire, he'll redraw his hands. Okay? And then he communicates with the central processor somehow. Okay? And then he has some communications, local communications, and some global communications, and some feedback. So that's Jonathan is reduced to this. Okay? That's Jonathan uh, Schuller, my son. And there he is now reduced to a, to a device. Okay? So this is what I started working, and now I'll show you two aspects of this thing, the sensor aspects, and I will show you the central processor aspects, the future. OK, so let's talk a little bit. So the, cent the, the, the sensor aspects has to do with nanoscience. And that's what nanoscience comes all about. It comes about in small little devices. OK, so, um, so uh, we actually realized this because we try to sell this idea to a funding agency or somebody that gives money. They will probably not tell you. But the, here it is how we solved it. If you look at the compound, there is this, this organic material called the metallophthalocyanin. From a physicist's point of view, these metallophthalocyanins are very, very interesting. Many of you use it. Actually, at this conference, I haven't seen. I'm trying to look if anybody uses it. These materials are blue. Copper phthalocyanin actually is what gives rise to the blue in your blue jeans. OK, so this is widely used. It's very interesting because it has a metal ion in the middle, and it has some organic compounds around it, some carbons and some oxygens and some things around it, which from a physicist's point of view don't, don't do anything. The only thing that does anything is the thing in the middle. And the thing in the middle can be the copper, iron, nickel, cobalt, anything pretty much. So there is this flat molecule that has a, has a metal ion in the middle, and that metal ion in the middle can be very active. Now the, the, the nice thing about this thing is that we can actually make it. We can use a, something called an organic molecular beam epitaxy system. It's a device that has lots of screws and, uh, and wires and things in it. And it's under vacuum. Okay? And we can grow this on a, these phthalocyanins on a substrate. And because they have this metal ion in the middle, they are very sensitive. So you can measure, actually, its resistance. And here it is, the electrical resistance of this in an actual device. So there it is, a device that now this is made by a co company, actually. Uh, that, that integrates this whole device of ours in there. So our device is just the thing in the middle there, in that yellow-looking thing in the middle. The rest of it is just standard electronics. And here it is the sensitivity of this to methanol, for instance. So here it is the, the resistance, the normalized current that you measure as a function of time when you start dosing it with methanol. And it turns out that you can use this for, many, for detection of many, many dangerous kind of materials. OK? So dangerous that you can use it very well to detect peroxide. And you would wonder, what the hell do you want to detect peroxide for? In 2005, terrorists blew up subway trains in London using homemade bombs made of a peroxide called TATP. The same explosive shoe bomber Richard Reed tried to use to blow up an airliner in 2001. But terrorists may soon find their bombs harder to hide. Inside this machine, a team of physicists and chemists built an electronic nose able to sniff out the explosive chemical. The actual sensing element is the small area inside the gold triangle. No bigger than a penny, this sensor chip can detect the tiniest traces of hydrogen peroxide vapor. Normally, thin films of copper and cobalt phallocyanine conduct the same level of electrical current when exposed to gas. But add hydrogen peroxide vapor, and copper's current strength increases, while cobalt decreases. Tells us that this material that is absorbed on the, on the chip is a, is a peroxide. About the 50 or more molecules that we and others have looked at, it's the only one that will give this opposite behavior. Small and low powered, it fits in a variety of packages for use by the military or homeland security. As a checkpoint monitor in airports, that sort of thing, to, to screen the people as they're coming through, have they been handling this type of explosive? The chip can distinguish between types of peroxide, so your whitening toothpaste won't raise alarms, and they're cheap. 
Once mass produced, these sensors could be made for less than a dollar a chip, a small price to pay to save lives. This is Jacqueline London reporting. So this is the sensor part of the of these uh, of these uh, devices that I showed you. Uh, as, as I'm telling you, this has been uh, licensed to many companies. They can we can actually also develop TNT. Uh, what I want to tell you is that we started working on these phthalocyanins not for this reason actually. We didn't start to work on sensors, and then we discovered sensors. We started working with this idea of looking at intelligence and looking at how you can integrate different sensors into things. And so. We can predict, and it led to this, and actually there is, I get some money out of this for my pocket, if you may imagine, okay? So now, the, the, here it is an important thing. The General Electric is here, and uh, they said that uh, the organization charged, uh, uh, the organization charged, no, uh, oh no, General Electric goes back to basics. It says there, for years General Electric made uh, a soaring, uh, 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 soaring something, uh, soaring, uh, products in finance. Now, after skirting with this disaster during the recession, it has returned to its roots. And its roots is making stuff. And that's what I want to, uh, to, to influence. That's what I'm very happy to be here, because here, really, stuff is being made. Not everything is sold in software. And so making stuff is important. And I think that's what I want to emphasize here. That's what, uh, uh, that's what uh, we have to return to this, because as you may know, it's hard to compete in making stuff with people that pay a uh, dollar a day. So, you know, if you live in Europe or in the US, that's very hard to compete with that. So what I'll tell you about is what is the future in making stuff. And I'll tell you a little bit about functional programmable materials. So this is switching the, the, the emphasis from software into the material. That's what I'm gonna tell you about. And so here it is a magnetic material that has a hysteresis loop. And this is what probably got me invited this because this appeared on BBC. There it is uh, uh, what is called the coercivity of this material. And it turns out that if you do something very unusual, which is the following, is you take this ma any ma magnetic material pretty much. Now notice here the coercivity of the material. The pro it's a property of the material. For instance, nickel has this uh, coercivity. It changes slowly with temperature, and it varies very little if you look over a temperature range. Now here it is what we, what we found, is that if you take nickel, for instance, but you can take nickel, you can take uh, iron, you can take cobalt, you can take ne neodymium, rom, iron, cobalt, you can take all kinds of materials which you tested it, and you put it next to an oxide, vanadium oxide. So there it is, nickel on top of vanadium oxide. And you measure its coercivity as a function of temperature for reasons which I cannot get that technical in nature, but, but they are easily explainable. Because of the interface between this vanadium oxide and the nickel, the coercivity can change by as much as factors of five in a very, very narrow temperature range. Now, this is, from a scientist's point of view, this is a dream, because this is what you want to do. You want to find something that nothing else does this. Now, from an applied point of view, they, they always ask, I, I was always asked, well, so what is this good for? So when BBC called me up, they asked me, OK, so we heard you do this. What, what the hell do you care? Why should I care? Well, so you know, there is all kind of things that disappeared in, uh, in, in Argentina, in uh, BBC, in the student science. Uh, students, uh, high school students write to me all the time asking me about this in Russian uh, journal, every, everywhere, it, it was everywhere. And the reason I think it caught attention from people is the following. Is because it has, maybe, and I don't want to tell you, it's hard to predict the future. It maybe has applications in two aspects, in magnetic recording, and perhaps here in fault current limiters. <coughs> so where it is in magnetic recording? For magnetic recording, you have two contradictory requirements. You want a large magnetic field stability, but you want a small coercive, you want a, sorry, a large, large coercivity, so you have stability so that when you go around with a magnet in your pocket, it doesn't erase everything in your computer. But at the same time, you want a small coercivity so you can write with a very small field, okay? <coughs> So those, how the hell can you do that? I mean, one says, have it big, the other one says, have it small. Well, the way people are doing this, I don't understand this thing. OK, the way people are proposing to do this is like this. Is they are proposing that the way to do it is what is called heat-assisted magnetic recording. And the way you do heat-assisted magnetic recording is that it is the coercivity depends as a function of temperature. And so you, at room temperature, you are somewhere here. And so the coercivity is big. It's so big that I can't reach it. You see, this is the problem with the short physicist. So I can't reach there. But if you heat the material up to 400, 400 degrees, then the coercivity decreases, 
and then you can write. And then you let it cool down again, and then, then, then uh, you again are very stable. Well, this is very cost consuming. Believe it or not, energetically, it's very cost consuming nowadays in computers. That's the main cost in, in computers nowadays, is the energy. And so here it is. You don't want to heat it up 400 degrees. You want something that the coercivity changes in a very narrow temperature range. That's what we have here. OK, so here it is, the concept of this. You basically can, uh, can in a very narrow temperature range, you can change, the, change the, the coercivity, and then you can write and read at the same time by changing the temperature about 10 degrees. OK, now, uh, magnetic flux fault current limiters. Actually, when I was doing my thesis, I did work on a fault current limiter. At that time, everybody was trying to sell a superconducting fault current limiter. Remember that thing that I was telling you in the beginning? Superconductors. Obviously, they are good. We thought it, you can do fault current limiters with that. It didn't quite work. Why is it? It didn't work. It didn't work because <coughs> there's many things that make things not work. So as far as I'm concerned, and as a scientist, a professor at the university, at the university there it is my transformer. You have a power plant, and there is a transformer in between your house and the power plant, and God knows what else you know, in between. This is my naive way of looking at it. Must light when lightning strikes, the, the, the earlier speaker told you about that lightning is one of those big things that happens in the intelligent uh, uh, power grid. When lightning strikes, it shorts out the secondary in the, in, the, in the transformer, and it burns the transformer. So what do you have usually in a transformer? Again, this is the view of a professor. This is not the view of probably you guys that know what you're talking about. So in a traditional transformer, what you have is you have current overload because of this lightning striking. So therefore, you have heating. and. Um, and then the heating reduces the coercive field okay, of the core. And so there is more heating. So this is kind of a runaway situation. And basically, the tra transformer continues to work, and it basically gets damaged. So now here it is a concept, perhaps, of a, of a current fault limiter. And you know I feel very uncomfortable talking about this here, because who knows whether this will work. But here it is. The current overload will produce two heating. If the heating increases the coercive field, then the transformer will stop working automatically, because the coercivity goes up. So you cannot go through the hysteresis loop. And the transformer stops. It, it cools down. And then when it cools down, it starts working again. So it's a, kind of an intelligent way of dealing with that without software, without having to measure anything. The thing automatically does it on its own. OK? OK. So now, and I will finish my talk with this PowerPoint. So this is really in the future. So let me just tell you about the current technology of computers. The current technology of computers, you have basically uh, let's say, five different uh, things that, that are important for the devices in the computer, for the transistors. A transistor can work at a speed which is much faster than one nanosecond, 10 to the minus 9 seconds, one millionth of a second. And a co we can make transistors which are between somewhere between 10 to 100 nanometers, so very, very small. They are very reliable. You can make transistors which work one, one per million fails. So this is fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. And uh, it, they are, but they are usually in two dimensions. So they are sit on a, on a two-dimensional kind of a real estate. And they dissipate about 10 to the 12 watts. If you want to have a computer which is, works of the size of your brain, it would dissipate about 10 to the 12 watts. It's enough energy that the whole, if you want a computer with nowadays technology to work, it would, pro it would use enough energy that you would have to have all the energy of the world powering this computer. Think about it. Now, there is a, a computer, which is the biological computer, that works much better than this, and the, which works with neurons. Now, think about it. The speed of a neuron is much slower. It's one microsecond. It's a 1,000 times slower. The size of a neuron is a 1,000 times bigger. OK? The, the, the reliability of the neurons, you know, things fail all the time in, in, in your brain, OK? The only advantage, more or less, is it's three-dimensional. But of course, uh, you c people are trying to do three-dimensional uh, software, uh, three-dimensional, sorry, computers nowadays. But the, and the energy that it, uh, that, it, uh, that it uses is only about 10 watts. So think about it. Here is a device which is much less reliable, is much bigger, much slower on each one of the individual devices. But at the end, the thing can do things like I told you. Jonathan can do things that my terabyte, uh, whatever the hell, uh, supercomputer couldn't do. OK? So this obviously is teaching us something. 
Now, the key is what does it teach us? And that's what it is not difficult to, not easy to, to figure out. There are new schemes for computing that are coming online. And the words that go with these are mem computing, neuromorphic computing, bio-inspired computing. It's not making a computer out of neurons. It is making a computer out of transistors and things like this, out of materials, but new materials, new intelligent materials in the sense that I've been telling you about before. And transfer the intelligence to the materials so that you can reduce the power and you can have a less reliable system because nowadays pretty much we're hitting a wall with these computers nowadays.